Gracious God, we do, we do stand on every promise of your word. And so we pray now that as we open your word, that you would open our hearts and minds to see you, to hear you, to be inspired by you, to follow you more, faith, more faithfully and obediently to the glory and praise of our King Jesus Christ. It's in his name we pray and all God's people said, amen. The congregation may be seated. Three weeks ago, we began our sermon series, Advent, Expect the Unexpected. We heard a story about Abraham and Sarah, ages 190, respectively, waiting, longing for the promise of a child. After all, God had told Abraham that his offspring would be like the stars in the sky. They waited and waited, and waited, and eventually uh, three strangers showed up in their midst and told them that yes, even in her nonagenarian age, in Abraham's centenarian age, this 90-year-old and 100-year-old would give birth to a baby. And Abraham and Sarah, they laughed because it was laughable, because it was funny, and it's in the midst of that story that God tells Sarah and Abraham that they are to name this child Chitzak, which in Hebrew means laughter. Fast forward, Isaac needs to find a wife later on. And a week later, uh, Elizabeth introduced us to the story of Rebecca, uh, one whom in a very patriarchal age God spoke to, uh, one who bore twins in her womb, and much to our surprise, uh, God seems to do something that we aren't expecting by choosing to use the younger, Jacob, to serve the older, Esau. Indeed, God is showing up in ways that we do not expect. This morning we fast forward several chapters in Genesis uh, to listen to our text for this morning from Genesis chapter 30, verses 22 through 24. After we hear God's word, we'll backtrack a bit to set the context for these words. But listen for God's word. Then God remembered Rachel, and God heeded her and opened her womb. She conceived and bore a son and said, God has taken away my reproach. And she named him Joseph and said, May the Lord add to me another son. Friends, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So we left off two weeks ago uh, with Jacob and Esau. Jacob, the younger, uh, violating in many ways the cultural standard and custom of primogeniture, the custom and standard whereby the older was the leader, the chief, the one who would receive his father's inheritance. We learned that, that in this story of Jacob and Esau, God chooses to show up and instead chooses to turn the story on its head. Rather than using Esau uh, to be the leader, God chooses to use Jacob. Elizabeth didn't go into all the details that happened, but if you take time to read through the story of Genesis, you will discover uh, that Jacob gets quite... Uh, creative. Uh, he's a bit of an entrepreneurial spirit. He, he has a, an eye for deception. He, he gets creative, and along with his mother's help, with Rebecca's help, he finds ways to deceive his older brother Esau and his, his father Isaac. He finds ways to deceive his brother from the blessing that he's about to receive from his father. He finds ways to deceive his brother from giving up his birthright. And it's out of the midst of this deception that there is sibling rivalry. There's conflict in her family, conflict. These brothers don't get along. Esau is not happy with his younger brother who does not respect him, does not respect the custom and culture of the time. And so Jacob flees. Jacob finds himself on the run. Jacob, in the midst of his fleeing, encounters the presence of God who shows up and makes God's covenant known to Jacob, the younger. He, he tells Jacob what he has told 
Isaac before him, his father, and what he has told Abraham before him, his grandfather. He tells Jacob that he's going to make a covenant with Jacob, that through Jacob all the families of the earth will be blessed. It's through Jacob's family line that God will choose to bless all of creation. Jacob, of course, eventually finds himself needing a spouse, a wife. And so he finds himself at a at a resting point at which he meets a young woman who is easy on the eyes, let's say. Her name is Rachel. And upon introducing themselves, they discover that Rachel is the daughter of Laban, who happens to be the brother of Jacob's mother, Rebecca. There's a family connection. And so Rachel invites Jacob back to her father's house, back to the house of Laban, where Jacob begins to work for Laban, his mother's brother. We pick up the story in Genesis uh, chapter 29. This is a story of attraction, a story of deception, a story of competition, and uh, lastly, a story of action. First, the story of attraction. Uh, Laban, uh, after Jacob has worked for him for a while, says to Jacob, because you are my kinsman, should you therefore serve me for nothing. Obviously, Laban doesn't understand why Jacob's there. He's not there for Laban. He's not there to work. He's there for Rachel. Uh, Tell me, what should your wages be? Now, Laban had two daughters. The name of the elder was Leah, and the name of the younger was Rachel. Leah's eyes were lovely, and Rachel was graceful and beautiful. Jacob loved Rachel, so he said, I will serve you. I will serve you seven years for your younger daughter, Rachel. Laban said, it is better that I give her to you than that I should give her to any other man. Stay with me. So Jacob served seven years for Rachel, and they seemed to him but a few days because of the love that he had for her. Story of romance. A story of one giving his life to Laban, one giving himself in work, in manual labor to Laban. And why? Because he wants to marry Laban's daughter, Rachel. The Bible tells us that they seemed like short days, a few days, because of the love that Jacob has for Rachel. And then the story enters into deception. So Jacob says to Laban, give me my wife that I may go into her for my time is completed. I've worked for you for seven years. So Laban gathered together all the people of the place and he made a feast, i.e. this is the wedding celebration. They are about to consummate this relationship. He made a feast. But in the evening, he took his daughter Leah and brought her to Jacob and he went into her. Laban gave his maid Zilpah to his daughter Leah to be her maid. When morning came, it was Leah, not Rachel. And Jacob said to Laban, what is this that you have done to me? Did I not serve you for Rachel? Why then have you deceived me? Laban said, this was not done in our country, giving the younger before the firstborn. Complete the week of this one and we'll give you the other also in return for you serving me another seven years. Isn't that interesting? Jacob, the deceiver is deceived. Jacob, the one who has spent all his life on the run, has spent all of his life finding ways to trick his older brother Esau, finding ways to trick his elderly father Isaac, finding ways to trick and deceive and wiggle his way out of of cornered situations. Jacob, this one, becomes the one who begins to deceive another. And and Jacob, in this situation, finds himself on the receiving end as his father-in-law Laban decides to deceive him. Uh, Jacob has a feast, a wedding celebration. Some of you might say, how in the world could this happen? How might Jacob actually find himself in bed with Leah, the sister of Rachel, and not Rachel, and not recognize it until the morning after? Well, the truth of the matter is, is that in Hebrew, a great feast was a great drinking party, meaning that there was lots of libations at this drinking party. The meaning that by the time Jacob went to his tent to consummate this relationship, Jacob wasn't exactly clear on everything that was happening around him. The the details were foggy and fuzzy. He doesn't remember things. It's only in the morning when he's come to that he recognizes that he's been deceived. Indeed, my friends, these are not the airbrushed pictures 
uh, of the characters of the Bible that we found in the flannel graph boards in our Sunday school classrooms growing up. These characters in our Bibles are not perfect. These characters have flaws. And so Jacob finds himself now in bed, not with Rachel, not the one he loves, but with Leah, the older sister. And when he calls Laban on this, acting as if he's been wronged, Laban says, listen, this kind of thing isn't done in our country. I'm not going to give you my younger daughter. First, I have to give you the first one. I have to give you Leah. Leah shall be your wife. Jacob says, okay, that's fine, but, but how do I get Rachel? And Laban says, simple, you serve me for another seven years, and you can have Rachel too. Jacob, the one whose name means heel grabber, has had his own heel grabbed. The trick is on him. The joke is up. Jacob finds himself as the victim of Laban's deception. And so the story then enters into competition. Because obviously, when you marry two sisters, uh, sisters who have grown up in the same household under the same uh, rule of, of, of Laban and his wife, these sisters enter into the same household, and they find themselves in competition because we know why that, that Jacob loves Rachel, not Leah. And so the competition begins. Uh, Jacob did so and completed her week, and then Laban gave him his daughter-in-law Rachel as a wife. Laban gave his maid Billah as his daughter-in-law, as, as his daughter Rachel to be her maid. So Jacob went into Rachel also, and he loved Rachel more than Leah. He served Laban for another seven years. The story continues, when the Lord saw that Leah was unloved, he opened her womb, but Rachel was barren. Leah conceived and bore a son. And she named him Reuben, for she said, because the Lord has looked on my affliction, surely now my husband will love me. She conceived again and bore a son and said, because the Lord has heard that I am hated because he has given me this son also, she, she named him Simeon. Don't you see that Leah is trying to find herself in the good graces of her husband? She's bearing these children and she's giving credit to God, but she's trying to find a way to make her husband love her. She has Reuben, she has Simeon, and the list goes on. Again, she conceived and bore a son and said, now this time my husband will be joined to me because I have borne him three sons, therefore he was named Levi. She conceived again again and bore a son and said, this time I will praise the Lord. Therefore, she named him Judah. Then she ceased bearing. Kind of reminds me of Aesop's fable, doesn't you? Aesop's fable about the tortoise and the hare. You know the story about, uh, about uh, a rabbit and a turtle that are finding themselves uh, challenged to a race. Uh, the hare is bold and arrogant and brash uh, and makes fun of the tortoise, and the tortoise challenges him to a race, and they run, and in the midst of the race, the hare jumps out to an outstanding lead, and he gets lazy, and he finds himself needing a break, takes a nap, and by the time he wakes, sure enough, the tortoise has crossed the line. The story of Rachel and Leah reminds me of the story of uh, the tortoise and the hare. I don't know if Leah can run like a rabbit, but I do know that she can reproduce like one. When Rachel saw that she bore Jacob no children, she envied her sister. Can you imagine? And she said to Jacob, give me children or I shall die. In ancient culture, the only way a woman had a purpose in the home was to bear children. The only way that she found her worth, the only way that she found herself connected to her husband was to bear offspring through this husband. Rachel is loved by Jacob, but she feels the wane loving because Jacob is recognizing that Rachel is not giving him the very thing that God had promised him earlier in the dream, the very covenant that God made with Jacob, the very covenant to, to extend his family line, to give him many offspring. Rachel is not fulfilling, fulfilling her end of the bargain, and she is angry. And so she says to Jacob, give me children or I shall die. Jacob becomes very angry with Rachel and says, Am I in the place of God who has withheld from you the fruit of the womb? Isn't that convenient? Jacob draws on God, says, This isn't my fault, this is God's deal. And she says, Here is my maid Billah. Go into her that she may bear upon my knees and that I too may have children through her. So she gave him her maid Billah as his wife, and Jacob went into her. And Billah conceived and bore Jacob a son. Then Rachel said, God has judged me and has 
heard my voice and has given me a son, therefore she named him Dan. Rachel's maid, Billa, conceived again and bore Jacob a second son. Then Rachel said, with mighty wrestlings I have wrestled with my sister and have prevailed. <laughs> She's kidding herself, right? Two children through surrogate compared to the four children that Leah has born in her own womb. So she named him Naphtali. When Leah, Leah gets word of this, when Leah saw that she had ceased bearing children, she took her maid Zilpah and gave her to Jacob as a wife. Then Leah's maid Zilpah bore Jacob a son, and Leah said, good fortune, so she named him Gad. Leah's maid Zilpah bore Jacob a second son, and Leah said, happy am I, for the women will call me happy, so she named him Asher. If we're keeping track of the reproductive statistics, if this is a rat race, we are figuring out, of course, my friends, that Leah is winning by a country mile. Leah has six children. She has four biological children. She has two children through surrogate. Rachel only has two. She has zero biological children, and she has two through surrogate. The reproductive statistics are not strong for Rachel in this case. The story continues. In the day of the wheat harvest, Reuben... Reuben, one of Rachel's sons, went and found mandrakes in the field and brought them to his mother Leah. Then Rachel said to Leah, please give me some of your son's mandrakes. But she said to her, is it a small matter that you should take them, take, have taken away my husband? Would you take away my son's mandrakes also? Mandrakes is a plant that grew in the field. Mandrakes in ancient culture were an aphrodisiac. They were hallucinogenic kind of drug, and they were used to stimulate one's, one's sexual desires. And so when Reuben's going out to harvest the mandrakes, presumably to bring them to his wife Leah to be used with Jacob, uh, Rachel takes notice, and she says, hey, how about you give me some of your son's mandrakes? Leah says, okay, it's a deal. But, but here's the deal. Jacob is sleeping with you all the time because he loves you more than me. So for one night, I will give you the mandrakes if you will let me sleep with Jacob, my husband. Rachel says, okay, it's a deal. I mean, what are the chances, right? Biologically speaking, you doctors in the audience know the chances aren't good. Well, you know how God works in those kinds of things. See what happens. Rachel says, then he may lie with you tonight for your son's mandrakes. When Jacob came from the field in the evening, Leah went out to meet him and said, you must come into me for I have hired you with my son's mandrakes. So he lay with her that night and God, <laughs> surprise, surprise, heeded Leah. And she conceived and bore Jacob a fifth son. Leah said, God has given me my hire because I gave my maid to my husband. So she named him Issachar. And Leah conceived again and she bore Jacob a sixth son. Then Leah said, God has endowed me with a good dowry. Now my husband, you notice this? Now my husband after six sons. Now my husband will honor me because I have borne him six sons. So she named him Zebulun. Afterwards she bore a daughter and she named her Dinah. Keeping track here, folks, Leah has nine children. She has seven biological. She has two through surrogate. Rachel has two, zero biological, two children through surrogate. And do you notice how both of them are completely miserable? Leah's bearing children. She's carrying on the family line. Leah is the one, by the way, who bore the sons Levi, by, through whom the priestly line would come for God's people, and bore Judah, through whom the Messiah would come. And yet Leah feels unloved, feels like a throwaway, knows that her husband does not love her. And Rachel, the one whom Jacob loves, wants more than Jacob's love. She wants a child. She wants a baby. She wants a child to call her own. We have a, a fascinating story because we have Jacob and we have his two wives, both of whom are completely miserable. And then we get to the action in our story. Then, Genesis chapter 30, verse 22, then God remembered Rachel. And God heeded her and opened her womb. She conceived and bore a son and said, God has taken away my reproach. And she named him Joseph, saying, May the Lord add to me another son. Then God remembered Rachel. This is about action. And the action in the story happens not through uh, the deception of Laban, happens not uh, through Leah's desire to conceive and bear sons. It doesn't happen through mandrakes or mechanization. It happens through the mighty acts of God. God remembers. God remembers Rachel. He has not forgotten her. God, God hears. God heeds Rachel. He hears her voice. And he remembers her. And he does something. He opens her womb. 
The story of a God who shows up in unexpected places is a God who never forgets God's people. Ours is a God who hears the cries, who hears the heart pangs of God's people. Ours is a God in this Advent season who hears the heart pangs of people all throughout creation, all throughout uh, the earth. Ours is a God who, who identifies with those who long for something more. Ours is a God who shows up and makes a way where previously there had not been a way. This is about the action, the mighty acts of God. I love how Walter Brueggemann, the Old Testament scholar, says it. He quotes Martin Luther. He says this, the action of God in this narrative prompts Luther to ask, does God have no other occupation left than to have regard for the lowliness of the household? Luther's question receives an answer not only here, but in the good news of Luke. In both narratives, it is indeed the occupation of God to care for the lowly, the unloved, the second born, and the barren ones. It is only because of the remembering and hearing of God that finally there is Joseph. Because of God. shows up in a babe born in Bethlehem, he tells the entire universe that we have nothing of which to be ashamed, that Jesus comes to take away your sin and my sin and the sin of the whole world. Thanks be to God. Thanks be to God. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let's pray. Gracious God, we give you thanks gift of your word. 
give you thanks for the way that you used the story from so long ago, the story of Jacob and his deception, deceived by his father-in-law Laban, tricked into marrying an older daughter Leah, bearing multiple children with her and with her maidservant, entering into covenant fidelity with Rachel, the woman he loves, Rachel struggling with infertility, giving her maidservant to Jacob, and then, and then, Rachel finally bearing a child, bearing Joseph. God, we know that in this story that you take away shame, that you act and you take away all the ways that we feel inferior, unworthy, or unlovable. God, we know that most especially you do that in the gift of Christmas. You do that in the person of Jesus Christ. The one who comes to us, who tells us that there is no condemnation, there is no thing we can do, there is nothing we can be that stands in the way of your great love, your great redemption, your great salvation of our lives. So thank you.